I just saw like a video of an artificially intelligent John Lennon singing a song that he didn't sing, but it was like a new song and it was all created by artificial intelligence. So like, are we going to climb above that? Like what, what's the meta level above creativity? Well, I think it's more than just creativity. Um, well, I think novelty is always valuable. And AI isn't really out of the box. It's really a distillation of what has been. Um, now, can it make other, jo uh, other jog jobs, uh, uh, jogs forward? Not sure. But, hey, more stuff to consume, more stuff things to enjoy, stuff that's really surprising. Um, it's all good. I mean, is the world worse if we only have a 40 hour, you know, if we have a 30 hour work week instead of a 40 hour work week? No, I think that could be kind of cool. More than, than all of a sudden we got, got to have more campgrounds and more entertainment environments and better, uh, better travel. You, you know, I'm a big, fan of the Hyperloop and the whole idea of being able to get on an evacuated tube and go at Mach 4 from San Francisco to New York in 45 minutes. I like that. <laughs> I, I want to live there. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I think I heard um, Mark Andreessen liken this new generative AI that we're seeing to... Um, that you see with chat GPT and, and some of those types of technologies as, as really sophisticated, like autocorrect mechanism, right? You input something and then it's going to, as you said, generate something based on some input it was given, but that is in some ways creativity, right? It's combining a couple things to create a new thing. Right. And, um, and I mean, you live in LA or in that area and there's been like a recent strike, I, I guess, of actors and what have you. And one of the facets of that was the, the threat of AI. But do you think it's really gonna, in your opinion, be able to generate that kind of creative output that people in those industries are, are producing, like movies and new movies and stories and things like that? Absolutely. I think there's no, in my <laughs> mind, there's no question. You know, when you have a series, there's a thing called, there's a, a position that's called a showrunner. And if you get a good showrunner, they can really do a great deal on a series. And once you have kind of the center of gravity of the series, the plots are pretty mundane, but, uh, and, and predictable. And I would, if I were a showrunner, and I were doing a series, I would absolutely ask ChatGPT or, or Regenerative AI to write me scripts for the next 30 less episodes, if not 50. And then I just go through them and see, see the one, and, and there's some ways that you can do testing of scripts um, for novelty or for interest and what have you. And I think I'd end up with a better series than I could with a bunch of writers. <laughs> well, you know, it, people it's, are going to hate me for saying that. <laughs> hey, you know, it, it's good to be honest. Where do we think, you know, this technology is going to be as technologists and, and what's it going to do? What is, what are its real capabilities? A lot of people don't understand. They see it and they don't really understand what's possible and what, or what's going to be possible. But I, I think you're absolutely right. And I will say this, my son and wife and I started to watch Knight Rider. Remember Knight Rider, the TV show oh, yeah. reruns. And, and I used to love that show when I was a young kid. And now I watch it and I realize it's very corny and the plots, everyone's a pathological killer, by the way. It's like, okay, right. he just drove through a red light. We have to take care of him. We have to kill that guy. That's like the plot of every episode. Right. And, <laughs> and so everyone's like a maniacal murderous, just killer. And, and generative AI could easily create the script for every one of those episodes. And no question. 
Well, you know, there was a movie out many years ago called Looker. I don't know if you ever saw that. No. But the no. plot the plot of that is that the evil movie industry found out that they could create on computers using the likeness of stars and they didn't have to pay the stars if the stars were no longer copyrighted. And so what they found is if they knocked the stars off, they could use them. And that was the thing. They were out doing murders of, of, of film actors and that sort of thing, and then creating movies around their likeness <laughs> using the computer. So, I mean, that, that was a synopsis of the, of the movie. It's called Looker. There's just so much that's real now that uh, that hasn't been, you know, tested in courts. I mean, there's going to be a, a question of if you tell this generative AI technology to generate something, a mini, a short story, a press release or whatever in the style of, and then you name your person, Hunter Thompson or, right. you know, someone who's alive, right? And so now the question is that content that's generated is that in some way infringing upon the likeness and the copyrights and the the intellectual property or the ownership is of that human being who's still alive the, because now you're generating content that they could have created and it sounds just like it came from them and none of that's been tested in courts yet but i know that's coming i think that's going to be a tough one you know because you know there are a lot of actors, comedians that imitate people with the same voice and they can, they can sound just like Jimmy Stewart or <laughs> Rock Hudson or what have you. Um, and so imitation, as long as you're not saying I am that person, I'm imitating that person, that seems to be okay. And, you know, a lot of this stuff, yeah, it's always the devil in the detail. Yeah. We've been looking to, to use this in with, with autonomous vehicles, right? And so that's an area of active application and interest. And so there's, there's, there's the chat GPT that people are used to and, and it, and it generates text and information and people think that's, <clears throat> some people think that could be threatening because it can generate wrong information and mislead people or what have you. But, um, but when you connect that now with a, a robot, a robot is you sense something from the physical world, you formulate some plan and then you act. And so you're, you're getting data from the physical world and then you're acting and doing something in the physical world. And that could be something that's potentially very hazardous or dangerous, especially if that something, that vehicle or, or that robot is a, is a, is a you know, a 10,000 pound car or truck. So, so now with the fusion of AI with robotics, you know, this is where I think people start to really get a little concerned. Right. And, um, and, yeah, uh, and, and, and they don't have to be malevolent. They just have to be unaware. You know, what, what, what do you mean by that? What does that mean? Well, it's, you know, with humans, when they do bad things, they're known as malevolent. Robots, if they're just swinging around and happen to clobber somebody, they have no guilt or no oh, no right. remorse on that. Right. You know, so, uh, and, you know, the fact that the person was standing where they shouldn't be, you know, no deal, no, no big deal. But <laughs> I like to say that self-driving cars is more important than world peace. And the reason is that there are more people killed on the highways than on in wars. And so if you're, if you're counting it just based on how do we save lives, self-driving cars is clearly the winner there because, you know, most highway accidents are from inadvertence or going to sleep or, or drunk driving or what have you. None of that happens with a self-driving vehicle. That's the hope and the vision for it. Um, 
know, I've been in, in the industry, I guess, for 20 years. And we've seen a lot of, we've seen some hype. We've seen some failures of these companies or companies um, come and go. Um, I but guess, it's early. Yeah. I mean, wh where do you think we are in the trajectory of, of things based on how you've seen other industries play out and evolve? Well, I think we're still in the infancy. I don't think we're in elementary school yet. Um, we're just kind of figuring out how to suck our thumb. <laughs> so so yeah i mean so then what does that mean in your opinion for like those companies that um that are that are like trying to apply this to cars right like of course you've got teslas with autopilot and you've got you know cruise gm with cruise you, you've got google or waymo i mean they're, they're applying this to cars robo taxis and putting these things on the road without drivers now um, I think, think that's, that's a little a smart premature. Thing no, I don't. Um, but I love the fact that uh, if uh, my wife has a Tesla and several times she's been approaching a car too fast and, and the car automatically pr puts on the brakes. And I like that. I think that's a, I think it's, I'd be willing to bet that Tesla's right now probably eliminated tens of thousands of potential collisions. Oh, I, I, yeah. I mean, I would ag agree with that. And that, and that's the, that's, I guess, in a way, the sad thing you're, you're always going to hear about the, you know, the accidents, the outliers. Yeah. yeah. But, but I mean, that's what makes the news. If it bleeds, it leads, but you don't hear anything about, you know, because what kind of story would that be? Hey, the Tesla or the so-and-so car saved, prevented this many collisions and this many accidents this week, that would get pretty, boring and repetitious. So yeah. you're not going to hear about it. <laughs> right. There, there's, there's a little analogy that I've tried to make before, which is take the, the automotive space right now, there are 40,000, something like that deaths each year in the United States. Right. That would be the equivalent of like two, seven, um, 747 planes crashing each week with a, with a mostly full load yeah. of, of people and if you read that if you got up every day and you read in the paper well two more 747s crashed this week you would never fly right yeah but that's what's right. happening with cars every day so you don't hear in the news you know that okay another 700 people died this week due to car accidents right. and countless others were maimed or, or hurt in some capacity or so you well don't, you know don't at that. some point Self-driving cars, the economics are going to switch remarkably. The first place it'll switch is auto insurance. As they show the autonomy drops the amount of, of uh, accidents, all of a sudden your insurance rates on these cars are going to drop maybe in order of magnitude. Um, and, uh, and then... When you look at, you know, cab drivers and, and that sort of thing being eliminated, that's just part of it. You know, you end up, you know, all the body and fender people, they're going to be less employed <laughs> and, and uh, insurance adjusters, fewer of them. You know, there's literally a good self-driving car fleet will change things a lot. One thing that a lot of people don't realize is highway construction. Because if you have a 50% auto drive fleet, it expands the, any freeway, it expands the equivalent carrying capacity by as much as five. Because now the cars can go nose to tail at speed without crashing. And so all of a sudden the capacity just skyrockets. Yeah. It sort of begs the question of, of proper application, right? Like whenever you hear aut autonomous cars, you think of autonomous cars that you, that you or I would typically drive, right? That getting yeah. from point A to point B, but, but there's not just cars or taxis. There's, there's trucks and mini buses and, and, uh, military vehicles, but, but then there's just all these applications like 
driving down the 101 to go to work or something is is a much more different task than an autonomous vehicle that just needs to get people around on a campus, right? Or yeah. or a um a rural sort of application or or logistics, right? Just moving things from point A to point B on public and private roads um to uh, just move goods around like neuro is kind of doing with pizzas, I guess, but. Yeah. And, and, you know, airports, the number of people that are being, you know, when you fly into Heathrow, you say, gee, I was coming from LA, but I didn't need it. I think I needed to walk there. (laughs) Well, here's the thing. The technology exists right now where you could get out of a car, you could get out of your car at the, you could park in the cheapest parking lot, wherever you would want to go. And you could get out of your car and get into a small autonomous pod like vehicle that um, if, you know, airports were to pay f- and, and, and deploy this, but it's technologically feasible to just get in that pod and have that take you all the way to your gate. And maybe another pod behind you peels off and takes your luggage to the luggage area, but you, you don't have to walk all the way to the gate and, and you could have um, these trackless people movers you know, right. all over the place at airports. And then, I mean, just like you might have it like a resort or, or, or what have you, but you can, this, that the technology exists to do that now flawlessly, but right. we don't have it. And there's a, I guess, why don't we have it? Part of it's economics, right? I mean, you know, the, these companies have organizations have to see it to believe it. Um, right. You know, and, and, you know, what, what always happens is there will be the early adopters, you know, like, um, uh, Places like Dubai, which are, you know, are talking about doing a lot of these things. Uh, and uh, once there's a lot of things that once you have an existence proof, it just makes everything easier. You know, going from an idea to a plan to an existence proof is kind of the step of how in- innovation goes. Like I can remember talking about video games uh, before I did did the first video game. And people say on a TV set, you you what you know, and people would say you know, I I was in a bar one night and 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 somebody walked up to me and they knew I was involved with it and they said how does the TV station know that I turned the knob? <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're used to what we're used to. Right. Well, now they do know, right? I guess they do know. Yeah. You change the channel on right. a Roku device or something. I hope you enjoyed the show Driven with me, Paul Perone, your host. Don't forget to check us out at driven.show on the web. And give us a thumbs up or subscribe here if you like the show. Thank you for listening in. See you soon.